Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Talk 20s podcast. If you're not already subscribed or following, make sure you do so you never miss another episode of us in the studio. And we've got such a treat for you today. We've got Don McGregor, who founded Social Chain and now a, a founding partner of Fearless Adventures. We've got a really amazing discussion here talking about everything from managing your business all through your 20s to sobriety and his whole journey with that. You're in for a treat, so make sure you tune in. Hey Don, welcome to the Talk 20s podcast. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. So we're going to talk a lot about in this episode about your 20s. Now, you have had a pretty crazy decade, to say the least. It's not quite finished yet. You know, a mm, couple of months to go. Couple of I'm months not, ago. I'm not quite out of the 20s. So. <laughs> but I think it'd be really interesting to understand the kind of headspace that you were in before you, before everything kind of went crazy for you, because that literally mm-hmm. did happen at like, literally age 20. So 18, 19-year-old Dom, what did he think his 20s were going were gonna to look like? I think... And I've had this conversation quite a few times this week, actually, because it's 10 years since everything kind of started with mm. my journey and kind of becoming an entrepreneur. And 18, 19 year old Dom really didn't think about the future. Never really thought about where I was going to go, what I was going to become and really kind of embraced the moment. Um, I always felt like at school, I kind of rode a wave of like just things were always going to be fine and never really had to think about the future, never stressed about exams, never stressed about what career I wanted to do. And you know, probably was a bit too careless, to be, so to say. But I really didn't think um, too much about that. You know, I kind of jumped through the hoops of GCSEs, A-levels, went to university, got to university. And, you know, my entire life at, at uni, because going to a Scottish university from, an Eng- from England, the first year is literally like the same as A-levels. So it was just a year to muck around. And I did. I, I spent my time playing football, I spent my time with making mates, you know, having fun. Um, and really, you know, studies were part of it, but never really kind of thought about the future and it was never something that really came across me until um until I started getting into something where I was like oh actually this could go somewhere so my headspace was pretty much laissez-faire it was very much just living in the moment very much about you know having fun enjoying yourself and seeing where things go and I never mm. really had a master plan like I always say to people you know yes you know I went on to be an entrepreneur but I wasn't the kid at school selling sweets I wasn't trying to like hustle or make a business idea I was literally playing sport, playing football, you know, my life was spent around that and um, not really caring too much about the future. Mm -hmm. Well, something kind of did spark that entrepreneurial journey for you and it was starting the Twitter page, Student Problems. Can you tell us a little bit more about that story and how that kind of began? Yeah, I mean, um, I think about 19 years old at university, I had, in my second year, I had three lectures I had to go to and those lectures were at 3 p.m. starts. So like... (laughs) My life was like, if I'm up before 12, that's good. And that's genuinely what happened. So um, because I was like, you know, very, very social, I was in the football team. So my Wednesdays were spent playing football and going out. My Saturdays were spent playing football and going out. Tuesday nights were about training. Thursday nights were about training. Really didn't have anything else to do in my life. Didn't have a job. So I didn't really, you know, I worked all summer to save money. So I didn't really need to have a job. So I was quite in a fortunate position where I just had time. So I spent a lot of time playing FIFA. Um, but it was at the moment when kind of social media was coming interesting you know you started to see this thing called twitter where you know you could tweet rihanna or justin bieber or stephen fry might follow you back you know i remember back in the early days jimmy bullard followed me on my personal account because i tweeted him i was like wow this is like really cool you know it's bringing you closer to celebrities that you idolize so i was kind of getting a bit obsessed with this and spending my time on it and started to you know create some funny images and put them on facebook and i was probably one of those people that you'd call like a facebook warrior Mm -hmm. who were like all day spamming updates about what they're doing. You know, Don McGregor is in the bath. Don McGregor has gone <laughs> to Tesco's. That kind of stupid yeah, stuff, yeah. you know. And I would be doing that relentlessly. So I go on my memories now and look from like 10, 11, 12 years ago. And I'm like, God, I did four updates in one day. What was I, you know, <laughs> what was I doing that for? It's a crime now on social media. Literally, it's a crime. Can you imagine updating your status four times in yeah. a day? That was me. So, you know, spent a lot of time doing the social media stuff. And then um, the kind of student problems was born from one of those drunken nights out. So on a Saturday, I went to go and play football and then went out to the uh, student union, as you know, you normally did, got ridiculously drunk, um, had a great time and then woke up the next morning. I live with um, four Scottish guys. You know, we're all cheapskate university students, so we're not turning on heating and uh, went to the toilet and, you know, no one bought any toilet paper. So there's no toilet paper there. So, you know, for some reason in that moment, I decided, do you know what? I need to tweet about this. But why, why do it from my account? Why not do it from the student problems? Why not create a student problems account? So I created an account, problems at uni, student problems, and tweeted that I ran out of toilet paper. And that was that was the first that was the first 
tweet I ever did on that account. And, um, you know, people ask me, why did you do that? Why did you start that? I'm like, just because, you know, just because I thought it would be funny. Yeah. And it definitely was funny. It captured the attention of, you know, how many how many uh, followers did that account go on to have? I mean, like, if you go look at the Student Promise brand, it, when we got to its like biggest point, it was like 10 million. That's it. So, absolutely insane and I was the first follower so I was the first person I was there like liking and cheering on my own tweets so you know <laughs> when people say like shout about yourself I was there like retweeting everything and you know yeah. so um, yeah it went on to like 10 million followers mm -hmm. and it captured the eye of your co-founder Stephen Bartlett um, you then went on to found a company called Woolpark which mm -hmm. later then then you worked on Social Chain did it become Social Chain or were they two separate things? <laughs> so they were two separate things so Steve was at the time running Woolpark so he was like you know, when, when I kind of got the account up and running and got to like 20, 30,000 followers, you know, just from me talking about my life, you know, mm -hmm. going around university, noticing things. And um, it was really, really enjoyable. And it was just something that I was doing as a little bit of a side hustle. I guess that's what you call it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm at university, I'm in lectures and I'm sat there like, okay, I'm going to tweet. So you start learning things about Twitter. You start learning about algorithms, best time to post. You start to get this like intrinsic feedback of just like creating content and what that means and all that kind of like data points that you collect. And, you know, that that was what I was building. I was building this kind of bank of like, okay, it's good to post at this time. This is funny. This is funny. This isn't funny. That won't work. So that all sticks within me. And then um, got to a certain point where I was like, okay, you know, what am I going to do with this? You know, I've got thousands of students I'm reaching, you know, let's see if I can put something together here. So I put an email in my bio and was like, okay, see if anyone emails me. Because every single day I was in like the uh, mentions and stuff and seeing who was tweeting, who was tagging. Like, it became an obsession. It's like, you know, it's something you just, it becomes an addiction. This is kind of where social mm. media, you know, it, it became an addiction for me. I was spending my time like looking at what people were saying, laughing and kind of getting that dopamine hit and um, put the email address in the bio and uh, two people reached out to me. So this one guy from Birmingham, no idea why, but for some reason, the other guy called Steve seemed like the email was better to reply to. So I replied to his email and we said, look, let's meet. Um, met him. He told me about the idea for Wall Park, which is basically Gumtree for students. And in that moment, you know, he was telling me about what we wanted to do and what we wanted to build. And I, w I was like still at university, still thinking like, what could the student problems thing become? You know, where do we go from here? Where do I want to go? Um, and, for, you know, we we got we got, we kept talking, we got speaking and then it became about, oh, you know, if you want to come and do this, let's drop out, drop out university and come join me at Wall Park and see if you can make this, see if we can make this a thing. Mm -hmm. What made you want to drop out of university? Because I think that's quite a big, big jump for a lot of people. It, it is. Um but coming back to what you asked me like when I was 18, 19, that thought about the future, it came from somewhere. And I think it came from like, call it like, like ego, call it like something, but just the conviction in myself that things were going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I always had that idea. I, I, my, you know what happens in my life? I was going to be fine. That's how I genuinely thought, you know, even like when I was like, you know, 18, looking at exams, like, oh, things are going to be fine. I didn't, you know, I was very chilled about everything. Yeah. And... What it meant is that like, oh, you know, I wasn't set on a path. So I wasn't like, okay, this is what I'm going to do for the next three years. I'm going to get my graduation. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I just kind of took everything at the time. So when this came across, it was like, hmm, it's an opportunity. And a little bit of me was kind of looking at wanting to do something different. You know, I felt like two years at university, which didn't count for anything, were fun. But, you know, and, and now I'm like, next year is going to matter. I wanted to go study abroad, um, but I didn't didn't really look into that properly enough, kind of had this idea about going to other Erasmus courses yeah. and doing a year abroad. Um, but felt felt like, you know, this was an opportunity where it's like, okay, see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the, and that comes down to it, like what was the worst that could happen? I go and do this for a year and I have to come back to university. So for me, it was just like, yeah, let's give it a go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it really felt like it wasn't, a, a tough, tough decision because the alternative mm -hmm. was the same path that I'm on. So for me, it was like, yeah, kind of got dwelled it over, spoke to my parents and said, yeah, I fancy doing this and see what happens. Um, and so he, um, I was offered £500 a month to go and drop out of university and go and work on Wall Park and said, yeah. Mm -hmm. You then went on to found a uh, social chain, mm -hmm. which will probably be the name that most people know listening to this podcast. What was the journey of like starting that then? Yeah, I think, you know, the the, the Wall Park um, business was basically come true for students. And what we'd kind of seen was that we could send people from student problems to Wall Park and in one click of a button, you get 300 people from Twitter to this website. And that was inherently valuable. Um, unfortunately, what we kind of discovered is that Wall Park wasn't necessarily needed. 
You know, mm -hmm. when you've got a business which is competing against Facebook and like Facebook groups, it's like, it's, it doesn't fit. Yeah. So unless you've got millions of pounds and you can go after it, it's never going to work. So we did really well. We had no budgets. We had to get very creative. And one of those creative things we did was build these network of social media pages. Mm -hmm. So my entire day was spent building and running these communities. And we'd have like, you know, we'd grow a Facebook page to 250K in a day. Like imagine that. Imagine being able to grow a page to 250K in a day. And we were doing that for fun. I was yeah. just like, wow, you know, we hit that and that was incredible. So um, when Warpack kind of, you know, the realization that that wasn't going to materialize had to, had to dwindle, we, we looked at what we could do and it was kind of the, these social media pages are interesting. We've, we've seen that they've got power and influence. We've got huge audiences here. Can we turn this into something, you know, have a bit of fun, make some money, survive, basically. Mm -hmm. That's the mindset we're in, you know. We're not sat here thinking these businesses are going to be you know, whatever it became. But we saw it as kind of like a chance to survive, get paid, have a bit of fun and buy time basically to figure out what we we're going to do next. Mm -hmm. But that business did go on to have a £300 million valuation in six years. Six years did it take to get to that yeah, point? Yeah, 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 yeah. Six years. So there must have been something in that idea because it grew so fast and so quickly. What do you think that was? Well, at the time when we started to speak to businesses, we were telling them about social media. Mm. So we were walking into big companies and we were saying, hey, you know, we know social media very well. Do you want to work on social media? And they said no. So like big companies, big fashion businesses that mm. are publicly traded, you know, we told them you should have an Instagram account. They went, no, no, we don't think it's going to be around longer. We don't think it's going to be a thing. <laughs> so that's what happened. You know, what, what, what we realized is that there's not many times in life um, a 19-year-old and 20-year-old can talk, call themselves experts in something and genuinely be able to say that credibly. Mm. Like if you walked in somewhere and said to like, in the finance world, you're an expert. No, yeah. You know, you, you're not, you're not gonna be- laughed out of the room. You laughed at it, you know, yeah. you can't, you've got to have real credibility to say you're an expert. So we kind of realized that because we built these massive communities, we were the experts and we had no doubt that we were the experts. So when it came to like speaking to businesses, you know, they weren't ready for social media. They weren't had a team that was structured, you know, they didn't have social media departments. They didn't have, um, people looking at this. So what what we realized when we first started is that we were pushing on closed doors. And mm. what really helped us is that, you know, that timing piece, being at the right place at the right time in, in business and entrepreneurship is so important. You know, if we were two years early and we had built the biggest communities on MySpace and Bebo, do you think we would have been successful? No, not one chance. But what happened was that the social media wave with Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, it stuck it's stuck and they're, they're mm -hmm. still on the same platforms 10 years later, yeah. which we're all asking questions over. You know, you can throw in TikTok and Snapchat to that, but the platforms haven't changed. Yeah. So what happened was when suddenly the the, the 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 kind of people's eyes opened to the power of social media, which, you know, we played a part in kind of navigating and showing by showcasing the data and the stats and the actual case studies from what the work we were doing. When people started to see that drive results in business, everyone started to, check, to flip. You know, mm. the first conversations we're having in year one with businesses were like, well, where do we find the budget for this? You know, these business, businesses set, bud, you know, big companies to set budgets every year. So you go and speak to someone and they've got a marketing budget and it's all allocated to Google, PPC, SEO and other areas and billboards and radio and TV. Then you go, there's no budget. But next year, the budget setter goes, well, let's put X amount into social media. So next year, when the budget conversation comes, oh, there's budgets. Mm -hmm. So a big part of it was the kind of, you know, right place, right time. So that, as that landscape shifted, of course, you know, these businesses needed someone to help them navigate social media because it was a minefield. Mm -hmm. So having built communities of hundreds of millions of people, when that phone rang and people said, look, we're not ready to, we want to talk about social media. Well, we could sit there and say, well, we are the experts because of these reasons. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the key factor for us was that we were in the right place at the right time as the industry, as the industry, the entire industry, the world started to open up to the importance of social media, the power they could have on social media. And basically they needed someone to help them. And mm -hmm. at the time, if you named other social media agencies, there wasn't many. Mm -hmm. So you're a 19 year old and a 20 year old, definitely experts in the social media side of things. But what was it like running the business side of things? Because that also grew super fast. You were then a 20 year old, but also in charge of a team of whole people and a company and how did that kind of side of things grow? That's that's the learning part. So all entrepreneurs are product people. So they understand their product. We were the same. We understood social media so well. Um, 
And then what you realize is kind of as the business scales, you actually have to develop those skills as well in terms of how to run a business. Mm -hmm. And that was the complete unknown. It was the kind of, how do you actually do this? And, you know, we were rewriting the rules in terms of how an agency operates and we were figuring out things as we went along. So the amount of times we restructured, we strategize, you know, it felt like every single two, three months, we were always trying to iterate something to make it better. And, um, then you kind of realize that there's some fundamentals you've got to understand. You've got to understand the principles of cash flow and mm-hmm. raising an investment. And, you know, you've got to understand how tax works and payroll and invoicing and all that kind of stuff, which is a necessity. You know, it's that yeah. kind of real like situation where it's it's sink or float. So swim or float, really. Yeah. Sink or swim? Sink or swim. That's yeah. the one. <laughs> sink or swim. And that's, you know, when you're, when we were young, all we only had one choice and we had the energy and the attitude and we we're just going to swim as fast as we can. And you learn it. But unfortunately, during that process, you make a lot of mistakes Mm -hmm. and learning comes from making mistakes. So um, we made a lot of mistakes in those situations. And people ask me like, you know, how did you come out the other side? It's like, well, reality is we probably made more mistakes than other people. That means we learned more. But thankfully, you know, we managed to have fundamentally some a great solid business, but that was able to allow us to be able to make mistakes and to grow and to learn. So... um, we were fortunate enough during the period to have, you know, great investors and C- and a CFO who helped us. But, you know, it took a lot of us time for us to realize we needed those kind of people around us as well. Mm. So that was the that was the growth, and that's where um, that's where it all comes from. Is you know we had to figure it out. You know, you put me in that situation. We had to figure it out. So a lot of reading, a lot of learning, a lot of understanding yourself, a lot of just being bashed around a little bit and being shaped into to who I am today. What strikes me is like the resilience you have to have in a role like that. Oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Just yeah. getting up and educating yourself every single day. Well, I, I had to break, you know, that's mm. what that's where the drinking came from is that, you know, I literally in myself felt like I had to break to be able to do that because, you know, it got to a point where I was just like, my entire life was, was you know, functioning alcoholic. You know, I was, it, you know, you asked me what I was like when I was 18, 19. And, it, you know, I started to think, you know, I've been very reflective over this drinking drinking problem I had. And it probably started, it was probably always going to happen. I was always going to have an alcohol dependency at some point in my life. God knows when, God knows why, but it was always going to happen. Because I was someone, you know, I was probably like a standard lad. I'd go out quite a lot. I'd always drink. I'd always be up for a fun, fun time. And when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, all it is fun times. Mm-hmm. You've got no stress. So when you drink, it's fun. You know, I had such a fun personality. I was a, I was a gr- really, really, ten- really, really good drunk and had did stupid stuff, funny stuff. And it was amazing. Um, and that was like me starting to build an emotional relationship with alcohol. So like great football game, win, drink, bad football game, lose, drink, you know, Mm -hmm. the things like that, where it becomes central to your identity a little bit. So when you start to to turn the kind of temperature up a little bit and those problems become bigger and those highs become higher, you actually then have the same reaction as you did when you were 18, 19 and you were drinking. So, you know, we'd win an amazing count. We'd win something like Coca-Cola or Amazon and, you know, I'd be drinking as a celebration, I'd be high, I'd be great. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'd have bad days where, you know, things would go wrong in the business or, you know, we, we know we have to fire someone and that anxiety builds up within you or, you know, you've got cash flow problems coming down the future. And then that's when I'd turn to drink and it wouldn't be like a, you know, a real like, oh God, damn it. It would just be like, I just need this to get to get to sleep or get to through, get through the day. So you just start to build this emotional dependency on it. And um, as the highs get higher, the lows get lower and, you start to become as an individual, someone who uh, functions on on those moments because mm-hmm. all you all you have in my life was highs and lows and they were incredible highs, but they were kind of really deep lows as well. Mm-hmm. You did um, a TED talk called Why You Don't Want to Be Young and Successful. I thought it was really, really interesting and anyone can listen to it if they kind of look at it online. But you talked a lot about the challenges and the experiences of of navigating the up and down in business and how ultimately your relationship with alcohol played into that so much. Um, looking back now, like what would you want other aspiring entrepreneurs to know who may find themselves in similar position positions? Yeah. I mean, the reason I said that is because you look at a lot of young people who are successful, you know, you can go through the whole Disney cast of, of the Disney club of, you know, um, what's you called Amanda um, Bynes, mm-hmm. people like that, you know, Real pressure on young people is horrible. It's a really horrible situation because you're asking them to make decisions for themselves. You're giving them freedom in terms of financial freedom and time freedom and no responsibility to no one to be accountable for. And you're letting them make their own choices. And those choices, you know, they could start off with underage drinking, but they can end up with drugs. And that's where, you know, Mm -hmm. drugs were part of my story as well. But I had no one to tell me otherwise. I had no 
um, parents who could, you know, had any reason for me to be a rap, to kind of, to be parenting me. You know, I kind of felt I was old enough to make my own choices. I had financial freedom. I had time freedom. I didn't have to be at work at nine o'clock in the morning. I had no boss on my back. So like I was left to my own, own devices. And I think leaving any young person to their own devices before they kind of understand the world and themselves is, is mm-hmm. a very difficult place to be. Um, you, of course, you meet some young people who are beyond their years, but I wasn't beyond my years at that point. I literally, a year ago, I was at university getting up, struggling to get up before 12 o'clock. Yeah. And now I'm in a business running it with, with you know, millions of pounds of turnover and a team of 50 people. And that that transition is so short in anyone's mm. sense that you don't necessarily learn about you and yourself. So, um, and during that process, obviously alcohol is so, so linked to me that I'm not able to learn because I'm constantly just on this flywheel of the downhill. downhill. So when I spoke about that in terms of my TED talk, I kind of talked about how society and how young people are actually set up to fail if they don't have the right support system around them. And I definitely didn't have the right support system around me because I was so young, I was so naive, um, didn't know much about the world, didn't know much about myself, was insecure in terms of looking for things with girls and relationships and short-term gratification rather than long-term and started to become a person I didn't didn't like. So um, it was a real kind of trying to warn people in terms of the dangers of, um, you know, you look at these kind of people, you look at footballers, you know, Mm. footballers have started to get the, the, the infrastructure right, you know, in terms of the support around players, but it still goes wrong in some cases. Mm -hmm. And I don't wish it on people. I don't wish what I went through. And I think, you know, what was the interesting part about it from my perspective is that I know a lot of young founders who have also struggled with alcohol, founders as well, not just young, but of all ages, Mm -hmm. who have had to leave their business because of the alcohol, because they have to get themselves themselves well. and I didn't have a choice. I just so I knew I had to do both at the same time. So I had to carry on running the business and get myself clean. Mm-hmm. And it really became a battle for me. And I think I, I wouldn't wish it. Where are you storing your savings right now? Just a quick one from our sponsor, Zopa Bank, home of the Smart Saver account. Zopa Smart Saver lets you save in different pots at different interest rates, depending on the notice period you choose to access your savings. The bigger the notice period on your pots, the bigger the interest rate. To find out more about the Zopa Smart Saver, download the Zopa app. We need to tell you that boosted interest pots are subject to a notice period, the longest of which is 95 days for the highest interest rate. You need to save a minimum of one pound and the interest is paid monthly and is subject to variation. You know, I, I know myself, I'm res- ridiculously resilient and ultimately sometimes completely deluded. And like, for me, I was like, yeah, of course I'll be fine. I'll figure this out. Mm. And um, it became a challenge. It became something where, you know, once we got to a rock bottom, you know, there was a couple of what I call like glass floors, you know, like glass ceilings, you got to break through them. Mm. Glass floors are like when you have a, when you hit the bottom, you're thinking on the bottom and then it breaks and you got to go further down. And every time the glass gets thicker and thicker and thicker and the floor gets harder and harder and harder until you actually hit a rock bottom. And they, so those, those, those flat fall down hurts, but you know, you can only fall so far until you actually get to the bottom. And um, I got to the bottom and then I believed that I could get probably deludedly get, get back up mm-hmm. um, without, any, without with, with help and bringing some support and telling friends, telling family, having a therapist and believe that I could get back up to the mm-hmm. top. There's a super interesting part in Happy Sexy Millionaire, which is the book that your co-founder Stephen Bartlett wrote, where he talks about you and the relationship that you guys had. And it says, we knew each other better than we knew ourselves. At least that's what I thought. He never told me he was how he was feeling. And I blame myself for that. He was too scared to show weakness to a tough guy like me who appeared to be unshakably resilient and immune to a vulnerability. So he suppressed his emotions and tried to act invincible, not knowing that deep down I was just acting too. Does that sum up everything that you kind of experienced yeah, in that time? Yeah, it kind of sums it up in the sense that you know, we talked about everything, business, problems, in terms of what's going on in the company, how we can get it better, but never about ourselves. And I think what we did as young founders was that our identity became so much about the company. We were so focused on that, that, you know, when that bedroom, you know, we, should, we lived together at the time. So when that bedroom door shut, the things we were feeling, the things we were thinking, we'd have to process and deal with ourselves. Mm. And I think until, you know, I didn't speak to him about it until it kind of hit the rock bottom you know, and you can watch it and you could see it and you could map it in terms of how I was acting. But it was, that's the hardest part, you know, how can you walk into something where you feel like you feel invincible, you feel like you've got this amazing company, you feel like everything should be great, but it's not, Mm. and it's not. And you don't, you don't even know how to approach that conversation with someone. So yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly how I was feeling. It was something where you also don't understand it. 
And mm. it's only now, like, we start to look back in hindsight at those moments and those periods, and I can start to understand how it happened. But in, in, at the time, it was just a, like a really kind of blur. You know, you find yourself getting shorter, you find yourself getting angrier, you find yourself, you know, four o'clock, just going to the bar and pouring yourself a red wine, and that that would be you done till Monday. And it's mm. like, it just, it's, 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 I talk about it quite a lot in terms of like, you sleepwalk into it. You know, if someone mm. has an alcohol problem, you don't see them one day being absolutely fine. Yeah. And the next day, oh my God, it's a slow sleepwalk. And I talk to people about like, look, trying to identify how, when that sleepwalk's happening. But for me, I slept, sleptwalk into it over mm. a period of time where it just batters you down. Mm-hmm. One of the things I'd really like to kind of understand is that like, when you were in that kind of headspace, do you also think it was because you were younger and placed in a situation where you had all these kind of responsibilities of like a whole team and all of those kind of things? Because I remember I listened to a podcast and you said you never thought about quitting, but you did like want somebody to sweep in and buy the business at one mm-hmm. point so that, you know, it's still a success, but like the pressures would be reduced. Mm-hmm. What Like looking back now, what what do you think your mindsets were in that perspective? I think, you know, the the thing about alcohol for me is that it is a way, and it's a very easy way for people to come across powerful. You know, mm. you go to a night out with lads and whoever downs a pound the quickest is, pro- is you know, is yeah. the guy. And that was the culture at the time, you know, whoever can drink the most, you know. So I thought, I thought to gain respect, that's a way of gaining respect and gaining credibility from people. Um, it is in some situations, but in business it's definitely not. Mm. So the way I was trying to kind of navigate the landscape of hiring people and trying to like have this kind of, assert power not power but like management and responsibility on people was in the wrong way so my energy was really unfocused because I thought this is how I can kind of like show I'm capable or whatever Mm. so um yeah that that was kind of the wrong way of going about it and I think one thing that um I learned from it was like showing vulnerability and honesty and actually going through what I went through was actually much more way of gaining respect than it was of what I was trying at the time obviously um but at the time I think ultimately you just want the pain to stop. You want what's ever going on in your mind to stop. And that's why you drink because ultimately you numb to it for a couple of hours. And then you can live in this moment of like tranquility where you don't ha- you don't think about the problems that are coming next week. You live in them, you're literally in this kind of drunken state of right here, right now. And that's all that matters. And that's what I was chasing. I, I was chasing away the pain. Mm-hmm. So my mindset, how I was then is like, whatever will get away the pain would be great for me. Uh, that could be selling the company. That could be, you know, me killing myself. Whatever gets the pain away is is what I need to mm. do. So when I went to go and see a therapist, that's what I talked to him about. So I talked about, I don't know what's going on in my mind. These things are happening. I'm doubting myself. I've never had this moment or experiences before. How do I stop it? You know, that's what I kind of talked to him about. And, you know, it was, so that's why people call it like a downhill spiral because not only does the drink make it worse, you do more things mm. when you're drunk that may adds to the adds to the fire and you just keep going down and down. So for me, it was literally, how do I stop the pain? Mm-hmm. And how can I like function? Become like, get me back. Mm-hmm. You're six years sober now. Nearly six seven, years, six and a half, seven. yeah. Wow. Nearly seven, so yeah. So you've 20, been on quite a journey. 23. 23, yeah. you stopped drinking. Yeah. That's pretty an amazing achievement. Yeah, 23, yeah. I, I, like the other week I was... I'd been sober longer than I could have like legally drank. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. That is really cool. So for those that are considering going sober, maybe they feel like they might be too dependent on alcohol. What would you say knowing what you know now, six years in, six, almost seven years in? Yeah, I think, that, you know, ultimately the reason people don't go sober is, you know, it tends to be the same reasons, you know, peer pressure. Yeah. Not, you know, I don't want to come across as not being cool. I don't want to mm-hmm. miss out. I don't want my friends to exclude me. And like ultimately, you know, everything you want to do and everything you want to to be around and the person you want to be is much better sober. So I always tell people that alcohol, alcohol, everything you think alcohol gives you, sobriety gives you. So what what do you think alcohol gives you? Well, it gives you confidence because Mm. you're a little bit of Dutch courage, you know, you can go and handle situations. You think it makes you kind of more interested as a person and fun to talk to. Um, you think it makes you be able to dance a little bit better. <laughs> All these kind of things people think alcohol gives them. Actually, you find it much more in sobriety. Mm-hmm. But the, the the biggest thing I've noticed since, since going sober is the confidence I have. You know, people go to house pies, they go to social occasions and they have this I- idea that one drink is going to make them feel more confident about walking into mm-hmm. the room. But ultimately that's a, a temporary solution to a longer term problem. You know, they're struggling with anxiety about social interactions. So... How do you tackle that? Well, actually, you give yourself more confidence. 
you get so much confidence from, from being sober. So um, I always say, tell people it is genuinely a no brainer because when you break it down, so imagine I'm not talking about sobriety right now. Mm. Imagine if I told you there was a way for you to sleep better, improve your mental health dramatically, you know, consume a much less calories, get better skin, better hair, better like look younger. And all of this saves you money. Would you do it? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Of course you would. Anyone would do that. Yeah. Everyone would do that. And then, I, then I'll tell you what it is. Stop drinking. And the minute you say that, people go, oh, no, 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 I couldn't do that. Mm. And it's just this bizarre social construct where we think that this thing called alcohol has to be in our lives and we, our lives revolve around it. You know, it's it's bizarre, but um, people really struggle with it. And I always tell people, people that and they go, I'd love that. Yeah. And then I go, well, stop drinking. And they go, oh, mm. no, 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 no. I think it can be done in small doses though. Um, you and a couple of other people who are in my life who are sober inspired me to to do dry January this year. Mm -hmm. And I actually didn't end up drinking until February the 13th or something yeah. like that. So six weeks almost. Um, and I was all of those things. I got, I could get up easier. Yep. I had more energy. I wasn't as tired. I felt better about myself. There was so many positives to it. And since then I've definitely drank less. There's been still been occasions where I have drank, but as a founder who has so many things going on in my life, I can definitely see all the benefits that you're talking about and reducing alcohol for me is absolutely going to be something that I try to mm. do in my life moving forwards. Um, there's a part of me that thinks about all the kind of social interactions where it's the peer pressure. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's exactly what you say. Like that's what most 20 somethings are worried about. You know, any young person is, oh, what am I missing out on if I'm not choosing to drink? But like, there's some good mocktails out there. <laughs> there is, but, but what are you missing out about? Like, yeah. you know, I speak to my friends now who are like 30 and the drunken stories are the same. Mm. They don't, the stories, there's only kind of so many stories you can have on a drunken night out. You lose someone, someone finds something crazy, something happens. Like you hear the same stories over and over again. So like how many new things can happen that are, are worth worth it yeah and that's what i kind of realized um as i got older it's like i go hang out with my friends and it's like this is the same things we do in 18 it's not evolved anywhere it's actually quite sad that this is kind of what's going on and you don't miss out you know you don't miss out on a night out because genuinely i don't think anything good happens after 1am mm. you know my favorite thing about not drinking being able to drive yeah you can just put, you can just leave your car and you can drive yourself home. No and taxis. You don't have to no order a takeaway because you don't feel like you need to have a greasy takeaway. Yeah. All these things. Yeah, there's like, a lot of positives actually that aren't just the so sleep many side positives. of things. So many positives. <laughs> but like, I think the social side, look, people people worry about it. Yeah, because yeah. they've got this unconscious thing about needing to fit in. You know, it's the pressure. You know, if, if you're the six of you, you don't want to be the one person that doesn't drink. Yeah. But that's just not real. Like it's really not real mm -hmm. because the interesting thing about it is if, if I tell people I don't drink, the first thing they do is tell me that they're trying to cut down. Like is you it? just did. Yeah, yeah. Like you just did. That's yeah. exactly what we talked about. You told me about your story and how you done dry exactly. January. So actually the insecurity of, of me, you actually, the people you're ever more insecure that they're drinking than you are not drinking. Never thought about it like that, but that's probably true. Cause yeah. whenever I was saying I was doing dry January, I was like, Oh, I'm trying to cut down in January. Yeah. It's the same. It's true. It's the same. So it is true. actually the insecurity sits with the drinker. Yeah. So what I say to people is like really own it and embrace it and say, you know, I don't need to drink. Yeah. And then when people said, why don't you drink? I actually say, why do you drink? Because mm. then no one can answer the question. Why do you drink? I like it. Yeah. What do you like? You like what you like? You know, people don't like the taste of vodka. You're telling me you like the taste of vodka. No one likes the taste of vodka. No. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of reverse justification of like, yeah, I, I like it. Yeah. No, no, you like the feeling it gives you when you get to four mm. or five drinks down and you've got that sense of numbness. Yeah. Wow. Really interesting. Uh, taking social chain to the public's markets then, back to the kind of business conversation. In just six years, it was valued at a 300 million valuation most young people will never experience anything like that in their life. How, like, how does that look back now? Like, do you have any kind of perspective on that? Because that was a few, a couple of years ago now. Yes, yeah, so that was three years ago. Yeah. Um, it's difficult because like every day, nothing really changes. <laughs> you 
you know, day to day. Tomorrow, your day is going to be very, pretty much similar. You know, there might be a little thing that improves. So every single day, you just start to adjust to what's going on in your life. Mm. Um, and that's how it felt for me. It felt like every day was every day was just a little bit more and not too much different from yesterday. And that accumulates over six years and something which which we experienced. And I think um, you get to the point then when you just accept this. This is life. This is reality, and it's not a big not a big not a big deal so for me it didn't feel like you know if I was 21 and I won the lottery the next day that's when you start to have this kind of like eureka oh my yeah. god wow incredible but it didn't feel like that it felt like you know it felt like a building it felt like you know every single day we, we'd grow and we, we'd grow into who we were becoming rather than it just being like an instant success so um I never kind of had that real like you know, jackpot, eureka moment, yeah. I guess. It was just more of just a constant. And that's how I still feel now. I still feel like, you know, in my mind, I'm still that 19-year-old guy that was running out of toilet paper. Mm-hmm. And that's how I see myself. Mm-hmm. Other people might be very different in how they see me, but um, I don't, you know, I've got the same eyes, I've got the same fingers, I've got the same hands, I've got the same scar on my arm. I look at myself, I feel exactly the same. Mm. Um, and that's because every day felt felt very similar from the day before. Mm-hmm. I think one of the questions that our listeners will really want to know is that you were obviously 19, 20 and really young when you were going going through all of this process. How do you, did, did you walk into rooms of people who are far more experienced than you in business and not feel this big? Because it comes back to what I said. We could talk about what we were best at mm-hmm. and we could talk about social media and no one would question us because we knew it. So no matter what they knew about business, whatever they knew about that, we knew about social media. And again, being able to be credibly in an air, credible in an area, which at 19, 20 years old, you can actually say you're the experts were. And that felt felt genuinely undisputed. Yeah. Um, that gives you confidence because you know you know more about them. And, and that's the key thing. You sit there and talk, you can listen to them about their business. You're never going to know their business better than them. You're never going to know so much more about them. But we just knew this one little thing. We knew social media more than they did. And that's fine. That's all we needed. And that was the that gave us confidence to be able to just talk credibly about social media. That's mm-hmm. all we ever did. Mm-hmm. Fearless Adventures yep. is what you do now. Um, you've become an investor. Yep. Team of thirty five. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what have you taken from Social Chain into the? What have you taken that you've learned from Social Chain into what you do? At yeah, Fearless there's Adventures? some there's some super technical stuff in terms of like the structure of the problems that companies face while scaling yeah you know and i think there's this misalignment between agency service providers and businesses Mm -hmm. because if you're a you're a business and you're looking to grow and you go and work with an agency ultimately you're paying them a fee for services the agency necessarily don't care how you're performing they don't care about the old kind of cash flow but they just care about their retainer so i think there's a little bit of misalignment there and i think when you're on a journey with someone and you're trying to reach something that is kind of a success point together if there's a misalignment by even one percent that can completely derail the course. Mm-hmm. So I think when it comes to businesses, you've got to have real alignment with everyone around the table. Um, so that was kind of one of the things that I really thought about. And when, it, when I started to look into the investment world and the VC world, and they can cross that over to the service space, it was very clear that there's no one who can provide those things in one place. You can, no one's providing the equity as well as service and support to help businesses to scale. So an investor might write you a check for a million pound, and then you have to go and find an agency mm-hmm. to spend that money on, mm-hmm. rather than actually, okay, no, we can do that whole thing. So that was a kind of gap in the market, which I, I kind of realized and um, saw an opportunity to go from kind of what social shame was in terms of helping businesses grow to actually help businesses grow and being part of the journey. So um, that was the main thing, you know, that learning from what I'd been through. But then mm-hmm. you know, there's a whole host of things you take from kind of the, the role of founder and uh, how you scale a company. You know, I'm not going to go above 50 people because above 50 people it becomes anarchy. Mm-hmm. No, I don't like a big business. I don't like a big team. I like a really good small set of individuals who you get to know well, who you can create like a high performance culture with. So um, things like that, you know, mm-hmm. just change your perspective on things. You know, you don't want to be running a business with, with, with a thousand people, even though it sounds like the ideal situation. Yeah. It sounds like, wow, it's such a great achievement. Yeah. You don't want that. You want a really good team, a really good culture where everyone can feel like they're building something which is meaningful. Um so think like loads of things, you know, little things like that, how to, you know, but ultimately, you know, social chain made me the person I am and that's who I am today. And I think the, um, the shaping of me has really helped my kind of position to help other founders and say like, look, I know it's not gonna be a straight ride and I'm going to help you because I've been there and done that. And I know how you feel at times mm-hmm. and having someone around you to do that is, is really important. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, 
on the Talk Twenties podcast, we love talking about the kind of failures that people have failures that people have had in their twenties, and how that has ultimately shaped them. Whether they are funny or whether they are a bit more serious, but that ultimately, you know, they have helped shaped you. And you yeah. talked earlier about kind of you failed faster than anyone yeah. else. Is there any particular failures that you remember that you'd be happy to share with our listeners? Oh, loads. I got loads in the personal life. Um. Like drunk Dom, who's the drunk version of me, like fucked up my life loads of times. Mm. So like he did loads of stupid stuff. So like mm-hmm. one time, like I was seeing this girl, he got really like I got really really drunk. I've been like seeing her for like six weeks, and like started to bombard her at like one a.m. with like emojis, telling her much how I liked her, and she was like <laughs> proper freaked out. She's like, "What the fuck? Like I've just seen this guy like, for six weeks." And, like, and I'm, I like I would never do that sober. And I like yeah. I was like, and I was like sending the mood. I was like, "What the hell am I doing?" So. um that ended. That was a big failure. Um, obviously, there's a couple of times when, uh, quite a funny story, when I came home one night from a night out and um, we lived on like a really steep downhill drive and it was icy. I slipped, broke my ankle, so I had to go into hospital. Oh um, and that was on a Thursday night. We went out, so on a Friday, I'm waking up and get a message from clients. I'm just like, I'm in hospital because I've broken my ankle. Um, we had loads of failures when it came to like things in social chain in terms of trying to launch new things and make things absolutely flopped. Campaigns failed all the time, you know, mm-hmm. things never actually worked. So you have to go and ha- handle difficult conversations and be like, look, you know, for this, 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 this reason, didn't work. So you, you just get used to kind of things going wrong. Yeah. And what you learn in those situations, it's not that something went wrong, it's your reaction mm-hmm. because it's going to go wrong. You actually get to a point now where I get to live, live my life now where I expect things to go wrong. And I just know at some point I'm going to have to deal with them. So yeah, the number of failures, like the whole thing, like the whole thing for me was just about those mistakes. It was just about not dwelling on them, not being too bothered by them, um, being able to like dissect them, learn from them, and then put them away in like a memory bank to know that when this next thing happens, you're not going to do it. Mm-hmm. So the next girl I dated, I ended up marrying. So Mm-hmm. You could say I learned from that. That's Georgie, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty, you're getting married soon this year, aren't you? Yeah, this year, yeah. She's been pretty, quite a big rock in your life. Yeah, yeah. I can understand. She's been, she's been, yeah. she's been a constant. So we've been together for seven years now. So mm-hmm. she gave me the ultimatum to stop drinking. Mm-hmm. Um, she won. Mm-hmm. Of course. <laughs> so yeah, it was me or the alcohol. So I thought, oh, yeah. God. Yeah. So she helped me with that process. So she was always there for me. Um, and she didn't have to be you know, I think we've been seeing each other for maybe a month when that happened so there's, wow. there's no reason she had, stay, but she had to stay by me but wow, she yeah. always said she saw something in me and she saw hope and potential and she, know, she knew that when I said I was going to stop drinking I did she thought she'd stick by me so you know imagine dating someone for the first time and like the first month and then month two they're going through sobriety yeah like you, you haven't got to hold someone else's shit you know you, you, you don't go into relationships to try and fix someone you know that's not what people should do but you know, she made a conscious decision that she's going to support me. And um, that was something which I was like deeply grateful for because she didn't have to hang around. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd done, I did things when I was drinking in those early days, which were what you'd call red flags now. Yeah. You know, still talking to other girls, mm-hmm. um, stupid stuff like that, you know, getting drunk, you know, doing drugs and all this kind of stuff where if anyone else was dating me now, I'd be a TikTok red flag. That's yeah. what I would be. <laughs> There'd be a TikTok about saying, oh, you know, these red, red, my, this guy did these three things and he's a red flag. Of course, you know. Yeah. But she just said, there's enough in here for this, to fight for. And if you're willing to fight for it, like I am and make these changes in your life and go sober, then I'll be here. Mm-hmm. And for here, someone to hear that was, you know, I had Steve saying the same thing to me in terms of he'll be there for me. And other people said that. It's the first time I had people put my arm, put their arm around me when I had the problem to be like, we're all here for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and it made recovery so much easier. So yeah, she was a great rock. Um, she gave again purpose. She gave me some kind of purpose to to prove it. Um, I think she realized what what my um, what I'm driven by and that's competition. So she always made it about me beating myself and not yeah. jumping another milestone. So yeah, she was she was great and she is she continues to be great. Sounds like a pretty amazing human. She's uh, she's all right. She's yeah. all right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think what's really interesting now is that you feel, well, I'm making assumptions here, but you feel like you're in a much better place than where you perhaps were at in earlier on in your 20s. You know, you're getting married, you're sober, you're running, you know, super successful business. Um, a lot of people will wonder, well, what, what's Dom got to worry about nowadays? 
everything in his life must be perfect. But we know from talking to so many people on the podcast, yeah. that's, that's never that's never the case. Everyone is always working through something. Everyone oh. has got something that they're working on at this moment in time. For you, what is it that you're working I'm on? I'm probably right working now? on more things now, pro- more problems now than I ever have in my life. <laughs> Then it's, and the thing is, they're different. They come from different angles. Yeah. You know, wedding. Oh, <laughs> family politics when it comes to weddings. Oh, like yeah. Family. I'm gonna, re- gonna oh go my god. That too soon. Yeah. Yeah. God. So we can, I can have a, do a whole chapter on that. So this this the problem. I'm so good when it comes to problems I can solve. Like great. Yeah. yeah. Give me a problem, I'll solve it. Yeah. When it comes to like these laborious, like petty family wedding, personal stuff, I'm like, this is just pointless like yeah i'm sorry you got upset about this i'm sh- like things you have no control over really. yeah, yeah and i've got such a low tolerance for like crap because like what it takes to get me upset and what it takes to get to bother me is like so different to what it does to like bother someone else mm. it's like friends and oh, all this kind of drama so i think it's the first time that i felt like the problems i don't have an ability to influence these other people's problems which have kind of been like encroached on me mm. and that's that feels that's difficult um that's difficult and you know we've got mold in the house and you know, all these kind of other problems adult stuff adult proper adult stuff yeah <laughs> proper adult problems so um I, I, you look life like life throws different things at you constantly there's mm-hmm. constantly challenges that you go through and um health and is a huge part of that family around you is a huge part of that and um these things become things that you're not used to managing you know yeah. you give me a business problem you tell me to go i have to go fire someone i can do that like the back of my hand of course i can those things aren't real problems obviously the other stuff isn't real problems either but it's just real problems you can't that don't mm-hmm. end so mm-hmm. yeah i think you know people have always got problems and i think it comes back to um the kind of internal external control you can only control what you what you can control um so you've just got to try and not get too bogged down in the the other people's crap ultimately yeah and um no unfortunately i'm a massive empath i kind of really want the best for everyone i want everyone to be happy so i do take on a lot of things myself and Mm -hmm. try and solve them and try and fix them and try and make them okay but if if there's other people around the table that can't make those things work then you're never going to get anywhere Mm -hmm. absolutely you're turning 30 very very soon looking back on your 20s is there any particular things that stand out um, I think every year felt like it got better. That was a big thing. Mm. And that was just something in some way, you know, it, it doesn't have to be like a real tangible, like, you know, whatever, but it just felt like this, this, there was momentum and this thing is getting, like everything's getting better. Um, and you're working towards something more meaningful. I'm very much, again, as I said, when I was younger, I didn't care about the future too much and I still don't necessarily, but like, I, I always had this mindset things are going to be okay. So I kind of think not in like a year or six months. I think in like long term and like everything's going to be fine in the future. I believe that and I've always mm-hmm. believed that. So um, I think, you know, I, I did I did the cliche. I did the cliche in a lot of instances. I got the the dog, I got the house, I got the fiance, I'm having the wedding. Um, it feels like I'm closing my 20s off like how they should be done like a, the textbook side of things mm-hmm. um, which feels you know I, I've never been one too pressured in those situations so it feels like you know I can really look back and reflect and say yeah I think I did my 20s pretty pretty justice mm-hmm. um, but also again still feel like massively it's a reminder of that I'm still r- crazy young Yeah, um, I've got so much further to go so many more things I want to do in my life Um and it feels nice to be able to, to to kind of think upwards and be like, okay, what what are those? Where do I want to go? What do I want to do? And um, if I told you some of the things I want to do, you probably, you know, maybe not. But if I told my nineteen year old self they call me crazy, I tell my friends and from home they tell me they can't they say I'm crazy. But I think I I think I'll get close to some of them. Any of them you'd happy to be happy to share? Yeah. Go on. PM. Really? That would be amazing sat here with a future prime minister <laughs> that would be insane <laughs> i'm interested in politics i'm interested in people yeah um i'm going I'd, I'd go into that world very very quickly yeah and um i could see it dom gregor future prime minister there you go i think you could do great things but look politics is really interesting for me yeah. um it, I, i'm drawn to it i'm drawn mm-hmm. to it um so yeah i think there's opportunities in those spaces which um 
young, more younger people should be getting into. Mm-hmm. I think the, the millennial mindset is very different to what we've got in power at the moment. And I think it can be a very different landscape. You know, there's going to be a millennial prime minister. There's going to be someone who's in the 20s right now who's going to be PM. Of course there is. Yeah. You know, that's how those Could things happen. Um, We'll Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. But I'm um, I'm really interested in doing things like that. And I think you're already working quite closely with government. You know, yeah, you've yeah. got amazing things going on with you know fearless adventures and the everything. Academy, yeah. You know, and the academy and everything. So it, it's people. Who, it's not impossible. It's not. It's, it's, yeah. it, you've got to know how to drive social change. I think that's the yeah. thing. You know, we if you if you if you really understand people, and you can understand like the areas of the UK of how we can make things better. It helps. And I think the problem with politi- politicians at the moment is we've got too many politicians. We've mm-hmm. got people who are you know, maybe period generations who were inspired to go into politics to be a politician when really actually what we need now is people who've got more real life experience Mm -hmm. and we're in a much more complicated world now. And I think if your life has been about studying philosophy and history and politics and you go into it, I don't think that equips equips you well enough for navigating the current landscape Mm -hmm. Um, because we've got to make big choices. The world's changing so quickly. And I think we need someone who's got more people in general across, across all the politics who've got more real life experience. Mm-hmm. I can see it now. Yeah. You start on this journey soon? Mm-hmm. Love that. A little bit of an insider knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Dom, it's been amazing to have you on the podcast here. I've loved reminiscing through your 20s. You've got so many amazing stories to tell, so many fantastic words of wisdom. But we always end the podcast with the same question. And it's if you could look back at 20-year-old Dom, you know, probably just starting off in the world of Wallpark, and give him just one piece of advice that would see him through the whole of his 20s, what would you say to him? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. I think I've been asked it quite a lot. Um, And it comes back to a couple of things, you know. um, Looking back on my 20s, what what do I think my greatest achievement was? Out of everything, no matter what I've done, it's it's the sobriety. Mm -hmm. And as I said to you before, I think no matter what happened, it was going to happen. So my advice to 20-year-old Dom is drink as much as you can as quick as you can, hit rock bottom as fast as you can and get back up again. I thought you were going to say go sober straight nope. away. No, nope. you've got to go through the pain. Yeah. That's unfortunately, unfortunately I had to go through the pain mm-hmm. and that was always going to come at some point. So you've got to make that, that choice has to come from a position of genuine change. You know, change only happens when the, the pain of change is less than the pain of saying the same. Mm-hmm. So find that pain as quick as you can and get through it. Wow. Amazing, inspirational stuff. Thank you so much, Dom. Good luck on your journey to become Prime Minister. I know we won't, it won't be too far away. I'm <laughs> certain. I'm certain. Let's see what happens. But yeah, thank you so much. We've loved having you on the Talk20s podcast. <laughs>